and you're right. good to go. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, moderate the session. Uh, it looks to be uh, from the level of interest uh, in terms of registrants, it uh, looks to be something that people are quite um, interested in hearing about. So um, we are very uh, uh, pleased to uh, welcome a couple of, um, you know, uh, uh, recognized commentators uh, and, uh, you know, people who are going to offer you some great insight into uh, the issue around timeliness of access to uh, new medicines. Um, I'm going to start by uh, introducing uh, Dr. Nigel Rawson. Uh, Nigel is a pharmacoepidemiologist, a pharmaceutical policy researcher and president of East Lake Research Group. Uh, located in Oakville. He's also a senior fellow with the Fraser Institute and an affiliated scholar at the Canadian Health Policy Institute. Dr. Rawson has performed epidemiological studies in the use of uh, medicines and their outcomes and pharmaceutical policy issues for more than 40 years. He's published more than 135 articles in peer-reviewed journals and book, book chapters, and he's the author of a uh, manuscript drug safety problems pitfalls and solutions in identifying and evaluating risk he's had uh, senior academic positions in the uk and in canada he's been a senior researcher in an independent research center in um, uh, within one of the Uni united states largest health insurers uh, collaborating with the food and drug administration on safety issues and he was uh, for a time GlaxoSmithKline's only epidemiologist in canada Sarah Lucier is, a, is passionate about sound economic analysis to support policy development in the area of healthcare. She um, joined the Innovative Medicines Canada organization in 2015 to support the uh, organization that's members with economic analysis and research. She's produced research on regulator, regulatory performance, public reimbursement timelines, private market forecasts and cost drivers, international pricing comparisons, and the uh, pharmaceutical insurance uh, coverage landscape. Prior to working with uh, Innovative Medicines Canada, Sarah spent nine years at IQVIA doing health economics and pricing strategy work. She's a graduate of the University of Waterloo with a master's in economics and uh, from McGill uh, with a bachelor in economics. So we welcome uh, both of these uh, very accomplished speakers to uh, 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 participate in uh, this um, issue. Uh, this uh, discussion today and uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes before um, turning it over to Nigel just to give um, a little bit of an overview. So uh, this uh, infographic that is uh, shown here and it's a little bit uh, small on this screen but um, I'm going to go through some of the um, the elements of it. So just to hear, to... sorry, um, just um, uh, wanted to take you through the various steps in the uh, Canadian review and approval process. Sorry, <laughs> got something in the background here. I apologize. Um, so uh, just wanted to take you through, as I say, the, uh, the uh, key elements of the um, uh, medication review and approval process in Canada. And um, uh, I'll start with a, uh, I'll start with a, uh, okay, what am I doing wrong here? Yeah, I just talked a little bit about what Health Canada is up to uh, in this context. So they are responsible, uh, broadly speaking, for protecting Canadians' health and well-being. And um, they conduct product reviews, not just of medicines, but uh, in the case of medicines, they ensure that medicines are safe, effective, and manufactured appropriately. Uh, they don't consider the cost of the medicines or prices in their uh, reviews. And they, um, uh, at the end of it, um, issue a notice of, notice of compliance or a notice of compliance with conditions. Um, and uh, the NOC or NOCC is uh, based on a product monograph that outlines the indications covered and the cl clinical came, uh, claims that can be made in, based on the data that was submitted. Uh, once the uh, uh, product is approved in Canada and, and uh, free to be marketed, it goes through a health technology assessment frame. Um, for most of Canada, except for Quebec, um, 
the uh, Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in, uh, in Health, or CADETH, is the place that uh, that, that work is conducted. Uh, CADETH is Canada's Health Technology Assessment Agency. It's charged with providing, uh, you know, um, rigorously uh, reviewed, scientifically based um, uh, assessments of the comparative cost and clinical effectiveness of medications compared to other um, other treatment options. It has two relevant programs in this context. Uh, one, which is focused uh, all on um, oncology medications, is called the Penn Canadian Oncology Drug Review. And uh, Peak Coder has a, a very sort of rigorous process of review that involves input from um, the manufacturer through their submissions, but also from pay, uh, patients, from uh, uh, payers, that is the uh, drug plans, and uh, as well as clinicians. And uh, uh, based on all of the information it receives, it uh, issues a uh, formulary listing recommendation to all the participating drug plans and cancer agencies that are uh, involved. Um, it also, um, um, has a another uh, review agency called the Common Drug Review, which conducts similar uh, processes for non-oncology drugs. And why that's relevant to oncology patients is that there are uh, certain elements of the cancer journey that are not uh, treated the same way as you know a, a direct cancer treatment. So, uh, you know, your supportive uh, medicines for nausea and things like that would. Um, uh, would go through the common drug review, or um, if you're, um, you know, uh, like uh, around, uh, you know, blood-related issues and things like that, uh, those those medications would be reviewed by the uh, CDR, and uh, your your standard uh, cancer medications would be reviewed by P coder. <clears throat> Uh, once they've gone through that process, uh, so you've got marketing approval, you've got um, your health technology assessment uh, review recommendation, uh, then uh, the products are considered by the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, which is a, a national multi-jurisdictional negotiations mechanism that involves all the provinces and territories in Canada. Um, they conduct a, uh, you know, um, a negotiation between the collective governments um, and the pharmaceutical manufacturer. And if those negotiations are successful, separate agreements are completed with each interested jurisdiction that wants to um, pursue that. So the, the agreements are based on um, uh, some the terms that have been negotiated nationally and then implemented at uh, the uh, provincial or territorial level. Uh, and, and these uh, product listing agreements tend to involve manufacturers offer some kind of financial consideration to um, to facilitate the, um, uh, the formulary addition. So once uh, all of those processes are complete, then each of the public formularies then uh, takes all of that information and considers it in the context of their own uh, local environment looking at things like budget capacity, uh, their own plan designs, uh, uh, clinical criteria, if any, as well as, uh, you know, their own specific requirements around price and utilization negotiations. And, um, you know, if successful, then uh, it get listed on the uh, public formulary. For medications in the hospital, uh, those are um, covered under our, our Medicare system, and um, those reviews are conducted internally within hospitals by their uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committees to determine whether or not they're going to uh, they're going to fund it there are one other uh, component of this uh, that's important for um, uh, you know access to uh, medicines is the work of the patented medicines price review board which is a federal regulatory agency that has a mandate of uh, ensuring that prices for medicines sold in Canada are not excessive mm -hmm. Um, it does that uh, through a variety of tests and comparisons, uh, both uh, within uh, Canada and internationally, um, and it determines uh, a maximum price that can be charged for a patented medicine. Um, it also regulates the level of price increase that a manufacturer can take on an annual basis, uh, 
as long as the uh, patent is in effect. So uh, as you can tell from that um, review, there's a lot that uh, is involved in uh, moving from um, the introduction of a new medication to the point at which a patient actually receives that uh, product. And of course, uh, there's time associated with each of those. And currently, the process is relatively sequential. Uh, the patented medicines price review board occurs in, uh, uh, you know, adjacent to uh, these other things, but the rest of it is done in a sequential nature. So um, with that as a backdrop, I'm going to uh, pass the uh, baton to, uh, to my colleague, Nigel, who's going to tell you a little bit about the uh, Health Canada perspective on this. So uh, Nigel, please uh, tell us what you have to say. Okay, could you go back up one slide? I can, sorry. Is that right, or do you want back? Back still? Oh, sorry. I don't know why this is not working the way I wanted it to. Wait, hold on a second. Ah, where am I going? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I need to figure it out myself. Uh, we're going the wrong way here. It's not uh, going backwards. Ah. Okay, I'm going to uh, just hold on one second while I get out of here. Okay. Well, I'll just start talking while yeah. you're doing that. My apologies. Go ahead. Um, so, yes, uh, so hello to everybody listening. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the, uh, the, the first phase that Jerry mentioned, uh, the Health Canada regulatory submission uh, process. Um, pharmaceutical companies do a lot of work before they get to that stage, before they're ready to submit for, uh, for, for approval for marketing. Um, uh, they go through phases with them. They go through animal studies obviously to assess the, the safety of the product. Um, then there's three phases that, uh, that, that, are, that are part of the process. The first is testing on healthy volunteers for safety, because clearly we want to have safe drugs as much as we can do. Um, phase two is testing on patients to assess efficacy and side effects. And um, of all the drugs, of every thousand drugs that uh, start through that process, only about uh, one gets to the phase three, which is um, where the pivotal randomized clinical trials take place uh, to assess efficacy and safety. Um, these are large studies um, randomized to try to eliminate uh, extraneous effects um, in which the drug of interest, the new drug, is compared with uh, either placebo uh, and or, or um, current therapies that uh, are on the market presently for the for the disease being or the, the condition being uh, treated. Um, for every um, uh, five drugs that get to the phase three stage, it's said that only one will actually get to the marketing uh, to, the, to be actually marketed. And now I'll have the next slide, please. So armed with this uh, large amount of uh, data. The company decides that uh, it's going to apply for regulatory assessment. The data that they gathered is predominantly um, intended uh, to satisfy um, the requirements of the two uh, the two main markets in or the, the two main markets in the Western world. Anyway, um, they're predominantly designed to um, obtain approval in the United States and in the European Union because they're very large markets. Um, I guess the other one is probably Japan. Uh, they, they're not really they're really tailored for those um, agencies. They're not so much tailored for for Health Canada. Um, but the same, largely the same dossiers, you know, or the large dossiers are, are going to be submitted to Health Canada. So what is regulatory assessment? Uh, what do they do? Um, uh, so all the agencies uh, look at uh, the efficacy from the randomised clinical trials and other studies. So they want to know is it, does the drug actually have a benefit. Um, they want to they look at the safety from the randomised clinical trials and the toxicology studies um, as far as they can go. Obviously, there, there's uh, even though there's maybe uh, 2,000 or so patients have been on the drug, that's not uh, that many. So there's a limitation on how a, the assessment of safety can be done. Um, so efficacy and safety are very important, but also they are concerned that the manufacturing process uh, is uh, of good quality and consistency so that, uh, that the, uh, the, the, the pill that comes out as number one is just as good by the time they get down to pill uh, 10,000 so that uh, 
there's a variation in the product. And then, of course, uh, there, there's the labeling process, and Jerry has talked a bit about that. Uh, in this country, there's the, farm, the uh, product monograph. Um, in, the US, in the US, it's called the label. Um, but a lot of effort is put into that to ensure that, uh, that, uh, that uh, healthcare providers and patients know what the drug is for, how it should be used, and so forth. And as Jerry also said, that, that this process, the regulatory assessment, doesn't look at cost effectiveness. Next slide, please. So um, how long does this process take? Um, well, I, uh, many of us, uh, quite a few years, have looked at um, approval times in Canada and compared them with other countries. Uh, some of you will know that uh, they started in the 1990s and that uh, approval times in Canada was uh, pretty horrific at that point. Um, but uh, I recently looked at the last uh, 15 years, between 2002 and 2016, for uh, drugs, um, uh, new uh, brand name drugs, so I, the new brand name therapeutic products um, approved in Canada, the European Union, and the United States. Um, these are, as I said, not, they, that would exclude ger uh, generics, uh, diagnostic products, and also vaccines. So we're talking about brand name new therapeutic products. And this slide shows um, the median approval times by year. Um, the median is used because of the, the, type, the type of distribution um, that, uh, that we have. And for those who are not familiar with median, it's a way of summarizing the data. Median time is, means that 50% of the products had uh, approval time, uh, review and approval time of less than that value, but 50% had uh, a longer approval time. So this is just the summary of data here. Um, uh, the, the variation is also important. That's not shown on here, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, so as you can see that um, in the first uh, four to five years of this, uh, the, these 15 years, uh, Health Canada had uh, quite extensive median approval times, uh, uh, certainly well over two years. Um, and um, the, the, But in 2006, that, uh, there was a considerable improvement. And from then onwards, you can see that the three, the median approval times in the three agencies are, is, is, is consistent, relatively consistent. And in fact, by 2016, they, they were really were the same. Um, so Health Canada has done uh, a lot better recently. That doesn't mean that there's not great variation um, by 2016. Um, Health Canada still had uh, some extensive approval times, um, but in terms of the median, then they're doing quite well. So these are all drugs uh, of the type I said uh, that are approved in the, those countries. Um, and this is an overview. So what about individual drugs? Can you look at the next slide, please? So these are some drug categories um, that you can see here. Um, I'm sure the oncology one is particularly of interest. And you can see throughout that the median approval time at the, the United States is, is generally less than the other two agencies. Health Canada is particularly bad in terms of uh, electrolyte and metabolism drugs. Um, that would include uh, quite a lot of di anti-diabetic drugs in there. But you can see that in terms of oncology, that uh, the median approval time in the United States is about half that, about, about six months, compared with about a year in the other two agencies. And one of the reasons for that is that, um, that almost all cancer drugs in the United States receive uh, what's called an expedited a, 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 a priority review, uh, which the timelines and the targets are shorter. And you can see that in the last, the last three bars, which shows the uh, median approval times for expedited review products. And you can see that uh, the United States, uh, the FDA's value is pretty much the same as the oncology. Um, so uh, the, the United States, uh, in terms of the FDA, gives significant priority to oncology drugs. Um, we do so in Canada to some extent, but uh, we don't, there's not so many. Um, so you can see that this is a general picture here. There's some consistency over the time. Um, but these are, these are drugs um, approved, as I said, in each of the three countries. Um, something like 70% or so of the drugs were approved in all three, in all, by all three uh, agencies. And so uh, looking at that, okay, next slide, please. Um, what I did was to take the drugs that were approved in all three, in all three, by all three agencies, and then say, well, where did the submission in Canada rank? So, 
um, if uh, if it uh, was was it was it uh, was it um, uh, submitted first in Canada, was it submitted second, or was it submitted third in Canada? And you could see that by um, that, that 70 to 80 percent of the drugs uh, throughout these three time periods that I've got here uh, were submitted uh, third in Canada. So you could see the the priority given to um, the other agencies as opposed to Health Canada. Um, so as a result, although the um, median approval times in the, in the, by the, in the three agencies uh, are relatively similar, um, by virtue of the fact that they start later in Canada, it means that um, they are approved later in Canada. The time difference isn't great. Uh, on, uh, on average, it's about uh, six months later that it's submitted here, um, but uh, so with a slightly longer or similar approval time. In Canada, that means obviously that they uh, receive marketing approval also six months or more later. Um, this is the overall picture. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Please. Yeah, I'm trying to get there. Okay. Just one second here. Okay. There we go. Um, well, this one shows for the, for the drug categories, and you can see again that it's relatively consistent. It's the, the, over the, not surprisingly over the uh, over the categories. That, um, it, that uh, the submission in Canada is also third. Um, and this particular this applies to oncology, um, uh, just as well as it applies to, to all the other categories. Um, and at the end, I put in for, for the uh, the drugs that uh, received an expedited review in the countries, and you can see that that's the same. So the picture is fairly consistent. Um, the point being that uh, uh, the submission is later here because we have uh, a lower priority than Europe and the United States by virtue of the size of our smaller market. Um, and so that means that uh, the, the, the next stage is uh, start later than they would uh, in those other countries. And that's, I'm going to hand over to uh, Sarah. Thank you, Nigel. That was excellent. I, am, I did have a couple of questions that came up while you were speaking. Um, one was, uh, and, and uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, I'm just going to get this out of the way because it relates directly to what Nigel was just saying. Uh, one question was, how does the FDA manage to approve oncology medicines in half the time of Canadians? And I know you mentioned a little bit about that, but um, maybe a, another comment. Um, okay, well, first of all, they give prior, great priority, but then one of the reasons is that they have greater resources. So um, we, in terms of uh, Health Canada, uh, we have we, Health Canada has much fewer people working on it. Um, the FDA is a much larger organisation, so um, they are able to focus uh, greater resources on those products. So I mean that's that's really the time factor, um, but also that they uh, it, they they regard. Um, oncology drugs uh, as a priority to get them to patients. Um, I'm not saying that Health Canada doesn't, but with lesser resources, then they can do less in terms of that. The expedited idea in, 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 in the United States, um, in expediting products in this country, uh, the companies must first of all apply for them. They must be approved uh, as being expedited uh, by Health Canada. And part of that approval is based on the resources that are available. So um, they may think the product's great, and uh, it, you know, so it's a matter of allocating resources. Thanks, Nigel. That's great. All right. So uh, let me pass it over to Sarah, and um, I will uh, move the slides when you tell me. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just add to Nigel's comment because, as an analyst, I touch lots of different files, including regulatory timelines. Um, but one of the things we noticed when we looked at it was that in the U.S. there's also just more options, more different pathways for expedited review. So in Canada, we just have one, well, kind of two, priority review and um, notice of compliance with conditions. But in the U.S., there's four or five different ways that a company can submit some, some kind of expedited, either, either submit earlier or um, just have a more expedited review pathway. So there's a lot more resources um, available for that, just like my Nigel was saying. So not only more more people and more resources, but also just criteria-wise, there's more options and more different uh, pathways that an oncology medicine could potentially go through to, to get a faster review. Um, okay, so I'm here today to talk to you about reimbursement timelines, not regulatory, <laughs> regulatory timelines. Um, but what I, if you can go to the next slide, I'm going to just take you through why we did this um, 
review a little bit of background, a little bit on the methodology, some of the main findings, and uh, some key takeaways that you can take with you, and then I'll show you where you can obtain the tools that I'm going to be showing you today um, for your own leave behind and uh, advocacy purposes. So a bit of background, this is not news to any of you, I'm sure, that Canada's pharmaceutical reimbursement system is complex because we're one of the few countries globally that has both a public um, system and a private system, and, and a private system that is so large, um, relatively speaking, um, in, in the entire system. And we also have a decentralized system, so jurisdiction, jurisdiction, provincial and territorial, and even some federal jurisdictions make their own decisions well, um, uh, around which drugs to cover, to cover and who's covered as well, and how much is covered. Uh, whereas most of the other countries, we see that there's one list. There may be there may be some decentralization in terms of decision making at the local level, but in terms of of, of what is uh, there, there's usually a national list and and one single system uh, of paying for drugs. Also, this is not going to be news to any of you, but based on some studies that have been um, coming out over the last few years, Canada's system is generally known to be slower than uh, other countries in terms of uh, public. Uh, plan reimbursement for pharmaceuticals. It's slower than private plans in Canada as well, and there's generally fewer medicines available. Next slide, please. So we came uh, at this really with the objective of answering the following questions. Where are we at in 2016? And I know that right now we're in 2019, but at the time that we started this analysis, it was 2017. So we just really wanted to set um, a baseline where are we at. Um, and really, in terms of the questions, how many medicines ultimately reach patients? How long does it take? How have we evolved in the last few years? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it the same? Why does it take so long? How do we compare internationally? And lastly, what can be done? Next slide, please. So there's two different um, analyses that I'm going to be sharing with you today. One is a, one is a pan-Canadian analysis where we look at the um, just the, the situation in Canada, and then the other one is an international analysis. So the data that was used for the pan-Canadian part of the analysis was starting from all uh, recommendations that were made by CADIS, um, which Jerry told you about earlier, in the time period from 2012 to 2016. So this includes not only new, like brand new novel products that come to Canada that have never come to Canada before, but it also includes new indications, um, as well as resubmission. So if there's been one try and it failed, then the company might resubmit with new data. That's all that that's included here. So the numbers you're going to see are a little bit higher here, for example. Um, and then we're looking at um, other metrics and other data points for those drugs, including the marketing authorization date or the NOC date, as well as um, timelines around PCPA negotiation, and then ultimately the public listing date. Next slide, please. In terms of the international analysis, we actually limited that one only to the to, to novel products um, for data availability reasons. So it's not exactly the same as um, the same scope as what I just described for the pan-Canadian analysis. Um, but the time period is relatively similar. So all drugs that received marketing authorization between 2011 and 2015, and then the public reimbursement was extended by one year to allow for lag time and be able to, uh, to capture those for 2016. And we included 20 countries in the OECD in this analysis. And the reason we selected only 20 and not 35 in the OECD is because we were looking for countries that are more comparable economically to Canada and that have um, more comparable health systems. Next, please. So what we did for the pan-Canadian analysis is we're essentially measuring the total time, line, total time from marketing authorization to uh, public listing in terms of days. Um, and within each, um, uh, each step within that uh, review process, um, we're also measuring individual timelines. So how long CAD it takes within that, how long it takes for PCP to start negotiating, how long does for PCP to actually complete the negotiation, and then how long does it take for the first provincial, um, and then and then ultimately to reach countrywide listing. So here I, I didn't mention it earlier, but we we specifically excluded Quebec because we were looking at CADIS only. Um, and so first listing is the first 
of the nine remaining provinces, um, NIHB and other federal plans are excluded. So it's really just the nine provinces um, that we're looking at. And the first of that represents the first listing and countrywide listing is uh, measured as um, the, a, a num listing in a number of public plans that cumulatively represent 80% of the public beneficiary population in Canada. So we call that countrywide. Next, please. So in terms of the international analysis, similar in that we're starting from market, marketing authorization in each respective country and the, day, uh, the number of days until they reach public reimbursement. But we also measure the time to launch, the so time first sale, uh, also in each individual country. So one, um, uh, in, in most countries, there's, there's basically one reimbursement date because there aren't multiple decisions being made in each country in different regions. So it's a centralized decision-making process for listing. So there's only the one date. And then generally speaking, then it's available to the entire country. Whereas in Canada and the US, we have this fragmented decentralized decision-making and listing process. So we developed three measures, so 20%, 50%, and countrywide listing represents 80%. So it's consistent with, with, with what we call the first provincial listing in the Pan-Canadian analysis and the countrywide listing in uh, the, the, Can the Canadian analysis. Next, please. So now I'm going to go through some findings. And what, I'm gonna, what, what I've done is uh, taken, we, we developed three infographics uh, for uh, member advocacy and, and stakeholder advocacy um, use. And so what I'm doing now is just showing you um, the infographics in, in pieces and explaining them to you. And then at the end, I'm going to give you uh, where you can get those. Oh, Gary. Yeah. So this is the first infographic. It's called Canada's Drug Review and Public Reimbursement Process is Sequential. And every step adds to the timeline. So Jerry already uh, alluded to that. So each step is indeed sequential. And our main key message is that needs to change because, because the, the, the fact that it's sequential is, is essentially what is contributing to the timelines being so long. Next, please. So the first uh, point, a set of data to show you is that overall in the time period we looked at from the date that a, a drug goes to CADIS um, until the day that it reaches the first public listing, there's a total of 576 days. And of that, CADIS is 236 days. Um, PCPA then takes 273 days to both decide to review and then to actually review it or to negotiate. And then there's another 67 days or two months until the first uh, province lists it. So we didn't, we didn't then add the component of, well, then how long does it take from then to countrywide listing because of some data gaps. Uh, but it just gives you a sense of this is the best case scenario. We're nearly we're nearly at 600 days. And that's after the uh, the year that uh, Health Canada took, right? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. So on the left side, this is this represents the uh, the actual products that go through the system, and it, what it's showing you is is the filtering effect with each additional step. So the the biggest attrition that you can see happen at CADIS. So from all the drugs that go to CADIS, and the and the ones that come out of CADIS with a conditional or positive recommendation, which then goes to PCPA, you're already losing over 20% of them. And then by the time you get to first uh, listing, um, you're at 33% that have come out of the, of, the, of the process. And then from there until products that actually reach countrywide listing, so essentially available to the entire Canadian population, you lose another significant portion. And by now, you've only got 26% left of all the products that went through CADIS to begin with. Um, that are listed consistently across the province. So 74% of products are now gone and not available consistently to all Canadian patients. So on the right side, we're showing PCPA negotiation timelines and it's split into two time segments. The bottom uh, turquoise color is um, the time from the end of CADIS until PCPA starts negotiating. And then the green is the time that the time spent in negotiation with CCPA. So you can see that um, 
in the time period, in the short time period that we were measuring from the, the beginning of 2015 until the end of 2016, there was almost a threefold increase in the total time taken for a product to finish CADIS and then to finish and then to get through the PCPA process. And both time segments increased, both the time for PCPA to start negotiating and the time spent in negotiation increased. So this one looks at uh, time series, so, um, our time period we're looking at was 2012 to 2016, but when you're splitting it into two, two year periods, um, what we're measuring is the time from NOC until the end of CADIS in the dark blue, and then the time from the end of CADIS until first provincial listing. So essentially you're presenting the CADIS, uh, the, the PCPA time and the, and the, and the, and the lag that public plans take the list. So whereas in the 2013-2014 uh, drugs that were listed, it took exactly a year. In the two years after that, it increased by a lot, as you can see, more than 100 days, 150 days or so. Um, and both, both time periods grew in that period. So both the HCA time grew and the PCPA public listing time grew. And part of the HCA time increasing in that, in that particular uh, case um, is, is representative of the um, backlog that occurred at CDR, which is now resolved. So if we're measuring this again for 2017-2018 listings, which we plan to do this year, we're going to see something um, closer to what was seen earlier, so like 200 days or so for, for, for CADIS to review. But the point being here that um, post-HTA timelines increased by a lot, and they actually increased by more than, um, than the HTA timelines did. So most of the increase, overall increase that we've seen in the time to reach first provincial listing, so here we're not even including um, countrywide listing, but even just the best case scenario, increased and increased mostly as a result of um, post HTA processes, including PCPA and public listing. Sarah, uh, Sarah just a, a question came up that I think uh, we would want to answer uh, sooner than later. Um, this question is, um, in when you're talking about CADETH here, are you referring to um, CDR specifically or P coder or both? Uh, in this particular graph, they're both included, but the next infographic is going to be looking at oncology specifically, and you'll be able to see the oncology specific number. So just okay. hold on for a minute. Yeah. So, not, shall I move on to the next slide then? Yeah. Great. Oh. Okay, so this is our oncology infographic. So similar message that um, the process is also sequential. It's in, unlike other countries, and most of the increases in timelines are occurring after PCOTR, so PCPA process, and then and then time for provinces to make decisions after PCPA. Next. So the one on the left you've seen before for all products, this one is only for oncology products specifically. Um, slightly different trend that you can see, the first provincial listing is actually higher than, than some of the um, other steps uh, would have you believe. And that's because uh, with oncology, there's traditionally or historically been, um, I would say more generous listing for oncology products. And even where CADIS says no or PCPA says no, some provinces decide to list anyway. Or sometimes some products only, like in the earlier part of our period here of study, um, PCOTR was just at the beginning, so there was a bunch of oncology products that didn't go through that process anyway. But the point being that there's still 60% of oncology products that initially went to CADIS that are not made available to the entire Canadian population. So there's a big gap, big difference, big discrepancy between uh, the number of products available to at least, at least in one province and then across the country. The uh, chart to the right is uh, demonstrating the total time to list from NOC to, uh, to listing for cancer medicine um, in, in the two time segments that, we, that I showed you earlier. So 2013-14 listing compared to 2015-16 listing. And then it's showing it to you also um, in terms of time to reach first provincial listing and time to reach countrywide listing. So in both cases, you see uh, a jump from one to the other, um, demonstrating about a 40% increase in the number of days that it takes for, um, for both for first provincial listing and then to reach countrywide listing. 
in the two time periods. Next. So you've seen this one before for all products. This one is showing it only for oncology products. And what you'll notice right away is that the time for P coder to take actually, or not, not for P coder to take, but the time between NOC and P coder actually decreased in the two time periods as the time after P coder, so including PCPA and public listing, public plan decision making increased significantly. Next. So here showing you the, the PCPA total timeline. So the, the, those bars on the left include both the time to begin and the time spent in negotiation. And you can see that that timeline more than tripled from the beginning of 2015 to the end of 2016. And then on the right, in 2015-16, the listing that occurred in 2015-16, um, the, the two bars on the right show that the dark blue that represents oncology medicine now take longer to reach countrywide listings than non-oncology medicines, whereas historically that's always been the opposite. Oncology medicines have always taken less time on average than non-oncology medicines to reach listings. And that's not because PCPA and the public plans are more generous and quicker, it's an, or that or that CAD takes less time, it's because manufacturers are more likely to submit to CADIS before they obtain their NOC for oncology medicine. Next slide. Okay, so this one is the international comparison. Um, so what it's showing here is uh, generally that Canada's public plans cover fewer new medicines and they take longer than most OECD countries to approve them. So in this particular chart, um, we're seeing the number of medicines that are listed. So on the left is the median of those OECD 20 countries for all medicines, oncology medicines and orphan medicines. Orphan medicines as, as they're designed by the EMA, designated by the EMA. And um, the Canada picture on the left compared to the OECD 20 median is, is showing that, generally speaking, there's a similar number of launches, so 121 compared to 119 new drugs that were launched in the time period that we looked at. But of those products, uh, a, pretty, a pretty important significance of um, products in Canada don't make it even to, to, um, to, to best case listing or to at least one provincial listing. So there's at least 30% of drugs that never even make it to listing anywhere. Whereas in the OECD median, 20 million country, um, the majority of them make it to reimbursement. Uh, when you look at the oncology medicines, it's about a 16% uh, attrition rate. So 16% of products don't make it to reimbursement anywhere compared to the median, like all of them in the OECD median that are launched also are reimbursed. <clears throat> and then when you look on the right-hand side, the comparison is made between the OECD 20 median and then the countrywide listing situation in Canada. And you can see that that, that difference is, or that gap is even greater. So only 39% of products that are launched in Canada make it to reimbursement again, compared to 95% of them in the OECD 20 median. And for oncology products, you're looking at 60%. And for um, orphan medicines, it's 29%. So in terms of timelines, yeah, timelines, the next one. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how long, yeah, sorry, Jerry, is there a question? No, no, I, I was just saying yes. Okay. So in terms of timelines, the time that it takes from marketing authorization in the OECD median country, OECD 20 median country, uh, is, is 313 days until it reaches public reimbursement, whereas in Canada, it's 534 days. So it's n not quite, but nearly twice as long to take to reach public reimbursement in Canada. And here we're talking about best case reimbursement, not countrywide reimbursement. So countrywide would be even longer. Our data didn't enable us to do it. The, the, the sample was so small that we couldn't really do it. Um, for oncology medicine, it's 272 days compared to 495 days. And then for orphan medicines, the difference is the, is the biggest. Next. So, 
just some numbers to keep in mind and to remember from this presentation. I know I've shown you a lot of data and it's different, it's measuring slightly different things and the numbers kind of change a little bit here and there depending on, on, on how we define things. But generally speaking, if you're going to remember a few numbers, these are it. So it takes 600 days to reach public reimbursement in Canada, give or take. 30 to 40 percent of new medicines reach Canadians consistently across the country compared to 95 percent of new medicines introduced in the OECD 20 median so that reach their patients nationwide. Half is the number of days that it takes for public reimbursement in the OECD 20 median compared to Canada, so 300 days, give or take. And then three times, that represents the increase in the number of days for PCPA to start and complete a negotiation for oncology medicine in the time period that we looked at. So lastly, I just want to leave you with uh, these key takeaways. So public reimbursement timelines are slow because of the process being sequential. The PCPA part of the process seems to be the main bottleneck and is causing growing delays. Oncology drugs have seen the biggest PCPA timelines increase. And internationally, Canadian public reimbursement timelines are significantly slower and the quality is significantly poorer, especially for orphans. Any efforts to reduce timelines by Health Canada and CADIS are not a guarantee that overall timelines will improve, and in fact, we've seen the opposite trend. And parallel reviews are needed, especially between CADIS and PCPA processes, in order to accelerate timelines. So that's what I'll leave you with. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah. That's uh, excellent. Um, I, I, I will uh, put forward a question uh, that I received. Um, how is the planned alignment between CADIS, INES, that's uh, the Quebec uh, Health Technology Assessment Review um, Agency, and Health Canada reviews expected to affect these timelines? When do you expect um, the alignment to roll out? Uh, so I think you're talking about the Health Canada project or pilot project, which is now in place to start reviews earlier and to align um, reviews earlier. So. What we've seen, and even things that we've heard from Health Canada, is the expectation that, in terms of timelines, is actually expected to be quite small. I think, I think when you're talking about Health Canada and NS, then then it could have a big impact because with NS, side note, uh, pre-NOC submissions to NS were not allowed until only recently. It was only last year that NS started receiving formally or, um, or um, accepting with the same rules as CAD as pre-NOC submission. So before that, it wasn't even allowed, so it was very rare. And plus, they had they only had a few times per year that manufacturers could submit. They couldn't just submit any time they wanted. So it ended up being the case that um, the majority of cases, there was a, a gap of sometimes as much as six months between when a manufacturer received their NOC and they end until they could submit for the first time to NS. So it, 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 there definitely was a big gap there. So the impact of that project between Health Canada and HGA bodies um, could be that it will have a much bigger impact in, um, in Quebec. So the timing that manufacturers can submit to NS. I know I didn't show any data for NS here, um, but uh, in terms of CADIS, the time, because there was already a pre-NOC system and process in place. And in fact, it, it's taken advantage of for um, many oncology products, more than 50% of them go through the pre-NOC submission process at CADIS. So that effort between Health Canada and CADIS, um, it's probably not gonna have a big impact in terms of timeline, but what it might do is just um, help with process efficiency, um, less duplication of resources. So it's, it might be more in a regulatory burden um, aspect for the in the meantime until they know more and have more experience, um, and it might actually it might actually start impacting timelines down the road. Just again, we're just talking about the time from NOC to the end of CADIS. But as I showed you in my data, after CADIS, Health Canada and CADIS don't have control over what happens once it leaves their uh, their doors, their respective doors. So unless PCPA um, shapes up and is able to figure out a better process um, collaboratively with the provinces and collaboratively with industry, um, with I would hope the support um, and the advocacy efforts of patient groups, we're probably not going to see much impact in terms of timelines for the next foreseeable future. 
All right, I appreciate the uh, response, Sarah. And um, I'm just going to ask uh, Nigel to uh, comment um, on on uh, Sarah's uh, research uh, just briefly because uh, he's done some uh, some comparative research as well. So, uh, Nigel, I'm, uh, shall I move to the next slide here and let you speak to the uh, um, to the New Zealand yeah, stuff? Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, this is not really a comment on on Sarah's research. It's it's just that. Um, Actually, I think you've missed the slide. Have I? Sorry. Um, oh, I got two here. This is the one that you want. There was one before that, which is the overall picture. No, uh, yeah, so those are the two slides I have. So maybe. A... Okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Sorry. So um, um, one of the uh, this is this is kind of a, a sort of slightly off tangent, but um, it, the, one of the proposals that's often put forward is that, uh, uh, first of all, that uh, Canada should have uh, a national formulary, um, and uh, Sarah's presented some of the limitations of having a sort of fragmented system, especially the limitations of trying to actually analyze it. Um, but um, the other proposal that's often put forward in, in Canada is that, uh, especially in relation to proposals for national pharmacare, is that we should have a system that's based that that's, that's, that emulates to some extent the system in New Zealand, um, and I thought that uh, that people on, on, this, on this webinar might be interested to just uh, compare some of the earlier slides that I showed with with this one, um, which um, what I did was take the drugs that were approved in Canada between 2002 and 2017, uh, the same idea, the new therapeutic drugs that's excluding diagnostics and so forth. Um, and then I looked at um, whether they were approved in, in New Zealand, um, and in particular I looked at where the submission was. Was it first in Canada? Uh, was it in New Zealand for the drugs that were approved in both countries? Um, this is really sort of part of a larger project. So for the drugs that were approved in both countries, um, you could see that, that, that submissions in Canada, remember that I said that they were later uh, than in the, uh, the submissions to Europe and the United States, the submissions in Canada um, are generally uh, much uh, the generally first before they are in New Zealand, and in particular, uh, notice that that really impacts oncology drugs for some reason. Um, it's uh, it, 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 I, I don't really have an explanation as to why that is, but I mean it's certainly the, the, the picture is consistent across the other drugs, but it particularly impacts uh, oncology. Um, so the tight, New Zealand has very tight cost containment um, um, regulations. Um, so when it looks at its uh, HDA process, it uh, is um, uh, very much uh, resistant to, um, uh, to, to expensive drugs and so forth. Um, and it looks at the opportunity cost. So if we buy this, if we include this drug in our formula, what are we foregoing and so forth? So there's lots of issues around. Um, why this would be so, but, but basically companies are much more, um, they maybe focus more on the Europe and the United States, but then Canada's uh, a little bit behind that, but New Zealand is quite a long way behind that. So the, so the point here is that, um, that uh, the stronger the cost containment um, aspects within a country, the less the attractiveness of that country is for, uh, for companies to, um, to launch their products. Um, they may launch, but they will delay it, or in some cases they, they don't bother at all. And you could may say, well, is this, you know, the next slide I will put up for, um, in the next slide, um, one, of the, one of the questions that came up was, well, um, was that because uh, New Zealand was very slow in its regulatory assessment? Um, and the answer is no. Um, this slide shows the median approval times in the two countries, and you can see that they're uh, with, with some exceptions, are relatively consistent. So um, really, um, uh, I put these in because I think um, we in this country are, are concerned about cost containment, um, affordability, particularly the current government is very concerned about that, uh, and, and understandably so. Um, but uh, maybe we don't want to leap from one uh, system that maybe is not so good, but to another system that really uh, uh, limits, uh, delays, denies access to new drugs in this country. 
Um, and that was really why I put these two slides in. So that was really it, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Appreciate that. So uh, a big thank you to uh, our two presenters uh, for their contributions. Um, I, I don't have any other questions in front uh, of me here um, um, that um, I, I can put to the um, to the uh, presenters. So if people have questions, this is your opportunity to uh, to pull them together and uh, send them in so we can um, continue the conversation. Um, but I do want to thank both of you, uh, Sarah and Nigel, for uh, your contributions today. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to address questions from the audience. If um, there are none from the audience, I can put forward uh, a thought or two as well. So I'll give you just a second to sort of consider that. All right, so um, I will... Um, put uh, this notion forward. Uh, so we, we, you both, I th or there, there was reference made earlier to um, National Pharmacare and uh, the move towards um, a potential National Pharmacare uh, process in Canada. Um, can you give some uh, perspective or view from uh, the, from the uh, idea of how that might affect uh, access to and timing of uh, new medications to patients in Canada, and I'll maybe start with Sarah and then ask Nigel to uh, to weigh in as well. Sure, thanks, Jerry. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that uh, reimbursement times, well, that Canada has a two-tier system and that reimbursement timelines in Canada are significantly slower in, in public plans than in private plans. I didn't show you data for... Um, for private plan reimbursement, because there's not really that much data out there, but generally speaking, what we know is that they're, they're a lot faster. Um, breadth, um, uh, we, don't, we don't really know breadth of coverage in private plans so much, but at least time from you know, NOC until the product shows up in a, in a first claim across the country in a private plan is significantly high. The other thing that we know uh, is significantly short, I mean, the, like maybe three, four months or something. The other thing that we know is that um, the majority of Canadians actually have a private drug plan coverage. So about 67% based on the most recent data uh, of Canadians have a, a, um, an, a, an employer-sponsored private plan or a, a plan that they purchased individually or from their union or trade association that they belong to. And so what that means for Canada is that if Canada is moving towards a national pharmacare system, well, what happens to those 67% or 23 million Canadians who rely on a private plan? Does it mean that they then need to um, go to the same level of coverage that public plans currently have? Or um, does it mean that, um, that they're going to have public plans cover a minimum drug list, and then they're going to still have to pay out of pocket to purchase additional or supplementary coverage uh, from private plans? Does it mean that they're going to have access to less uh, products and a lot more slowly? Um, do our cancer patients going to now have to go through bureaucracy? Uh, patients that rely on specialty products for their complex conditions, does it mean that they're going to now have to apply to lots of government programs to maybe get coverage but not really know if they will? So there's a lot of questions that we don't know and the Hoskins uh, Implementation Committee of National Pharmacare is looking in the question and they're going to be um, making recommendations and the, we're expecting that the federal election is, um, is going to include national, some kind of national program in their, in their platform, electoral platform. So what the data here shows is that if private plans disappear or private plan coverage disappears and is replaced by public plans, Knowing the state of public plan coverage in the country, fewer products, fewer than even international countries, um, and significantly longer timelines, well, that might be the reset. that might be what results um, for all Canadian patients, including those that currently rely on private plans. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I'll, um, Nigel, I'll give you a chance to respond, but uh, just to let you know, we're at the end, so uh, briefer okay. the better, so I can uh, close okay. up. Uh, I, yes, I mean, there's, there's lots of questions, as Sarah said. Um, the uh, trial with OHIP uh, for the 
uh, children's plan that was put in place in uh, in Ontario, uh, where the public plan became the first uh, payer. Uh, I think demonstrated some of the problems with taking away the benefits from private insurance uh, and the issues and the concerns that, uh, that that people raised over that. Um, and I guess the other fa the other thing I would just say is that. Um, uh, it really depends what the intention of National Pharmacare is. Is it designed to provide a fair and just system that uh, that, that provides the uh, provides access to medications that people actually need, or is it simply a process uh, to uh, strictly control cost? Okay, so some uh, good thoughts at the end. Um, I uh, uh, we're. Um... We've come to the uh, to the end of the session, and I want to thank everybody uh, for participating and uh, listening to to the uh, presentations. Um, and of course, uh, again, a uh, thank you to Sarah and to Nigel for their contributions. Um, we will, of course, in 2019, continue to bring you um, more interesting uh, and uh, hopefully insightful uh, webinars. Uh, and I'll pass it back to um, to Allison for the close. So thanks everybody for your time. Uh, hopefully, um, yeah, this was a benefit to you.